Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. Alina has gone and done something uh, with, basically you've done this for Lucy, haven't you? I've done it for Lucy, but I've also done it for, for us because I love, I love ancient history. It's my hidden secret. That isn't that's... hidden at all. Uh, no, it's not hidden at all. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, if it's ancient history, I love it. Um, and then this is just extra special because Lucy loves this subject. So Lucy... Just for you, we've got with us today Carolyn Willickis, who is a classicist, author and senior lecturer in the Department of General Education at Mount Royal University. She's written books like, ready, The Horse in the Ancient World and Greek Warriors. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, we're happy to have you. Literally, Lucy is going to be bouncing off the walls. She loves all things horse. She is forever blabbing on about World War One horses and mules and stuff. So she's going to love this, as are many other people. Um, why horses? Are you are you a horsey person? You must be. I am. Um, I've um, I've I've ridden horses uh, basically for most of my life. Uh, started when I was ten, so going on uh, thirty years now. Um, I mean, I didn't, uh, by no means did I grow up in the horsey set. Uh, I, I grew up in a suburb of, of basically Toronto, Ontario. My mom is terrified of horses. My brother is allergic to horses and my father is indifferent to horses. And yet here we are. Um, so yeah, horses, uh, I was your typical horse mad uh, little girl who nagged her, her parents incessantly for riding lessons. And they um, uh, foolishly agreed eventually. And uh, here we go. Now it's become my life. Um, I'm sure <laughs> I loved it. So we're still trying to figure out how it happened. I think, um, but yeah. I am like the <laughs> antithesis of the horsey obsessed. I want a pony child. I my parents sat me on one in I think Tenerife when I was about five, and it moved, and I didn't like it, and they took me off, and I remember booting it in the ankle in disgust, um, and that's my <laughs> sum total of my whole life's exposure to real horses. And I'm the opposite because I was one of those horsey kids who went horse riding uh, every weekend or every week as much as, and I even did my work experience for two weeks at a horse riding stable just so I could ride every day. That was a waste of time giving up that you ended up being a concentration camp historian. Well, exactly. So I didn't (laughs) follow my passion in horses. Instead, I deal with the dark. So, but I'm going to love this because this is right up my alley. I mean, yeah, I never, uh, I, I never planned on studying horses in, in grad school and, and, yeah, having this be my specialty. It never really occurred to me, to be quite honest. I assumed if I wanted to study horses, I had to be a veterinarian or go into, like, bio-sci. And um, when I started my master's degree, uh, my, my wonderful supervisor, who, who was a fantastic mentor, um, it was actually his suggestion. He didn't like the topic that I had picked about Alexander the Great. And uh, he basically said, but you ride horses. And I was like, I do why don't you write about cavalry? Because I don't know anything about warfare. He's like, but you know things about horses. And he gave me some books to read and they made me scratch my head and wonder what people thought about how horses actually functioned. And uh, I fell into this rabbit hole that I've yet to climb out of in in studying uh, horses in, in antiquity. So, And yet here we are, exactly. This is like, it's all about the rabbit holes with historians, isn't it? So mm-hmm. let's start right at the beginning. I mean, so... Who owned horses in the ancient world? Everyone? Not everyone. No. Slaves wouldn't have. Uh, was it a general thing or is it a big deal if you own a horse? So horses have uh, pretty much, from the time of their domestication, been a marker of status. Um, I love them dearly, but they're not the most practical animals in the world. Like in, in sort of the grand scheme of, of animals that we've domesticated to improve our lives, uh, horses were one of the the last major domesticates, um, certainly long after cattle and sheep and goats and 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 uh, dogs and cats and things like that. Um, and they're just they can be tricky to maintain. So they've they've long been representations of the elite, um, but the way they represent that depends on cultural context. So if we look at a place like the the Eurasian steppe, you know, the steppes of Central Asia, which is probably where the horse was domesticated. You now we're looking at pastoralist nomadic groups um, where the status then comes from the number of animals that you own. So having one horse would be like, oh, great, you've got one horse, but having 
a hundred horses or, you know, these vast herds of horses, that then becomes your marker of status. The more, the more horses you have, um, the, the wealthier you are perceived as being and the more influential you probably are within your community. If we then shift to sort of the, the Greek world or the Roman world and, and look at more urban settings, Obviously, you don't have the resources, the land, the space to amass these these substantial herds of horses. And so even owning a single horse um, marks you out as someone of wealth and importance. Um, you know, the, 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 the Greek sage, the lawgiver Solon, the Athenian lawgiver Solon in the 6th century, he sort of overhauled... Uh, Athens because it was basically in this constant shit show of crisis mm. um, and civil war and, and all of that. And he reorganized the, basically the hierarchies based on wealth as opposed to birth. Uh, and one of the, so there's four categories he creates and the second highest category is the hippies, the knights. And so these are people who have the wealth to maintain a horse uh, for the purpose of fighting in the cavalry. So um, horses are beyond a doubt. They are not for everybody. They are not the prerogative of everybody. Um, they are they are the emblem of, of the elites. Um, because by and large, particularly in the Mediterranean world, particularly in the classical world, they're not really being used for a lot of practical day-to-day -day work either, right? They're like the sports car is how I sort of tend to refer to them is. Okay. You know, the donkey is like the the you know, the old four by four that, that does the work and, and the mule is a slightly fancier version of that. And the horse, the horse is really the sports car that you sort of dust out and, and dust off and pull out when you want to be noticed. Uh, see, I would have assumed that pretty much everyone was riding around on a horse in the ancient world because it's the only way to travel. No, no. Um, donkey cart, mule cart, uh, ox cart and good old by foot. Um, would have been uh, probably far more common than if you had horses, they were certainly a good way to travel, a, a mm. faster way to travel. Uh, but in terms of, uh, again, looking at the, the Mediterranean world and sort of more urban environments, uh, horses um, would not have been accessible to large portions of the population. I've got to say that it's not really changed much from the modern time because any of my friends who ever owned, owned a horse, they were slightly on the wealthier side rather than us who had nothing. So we couldn't afford to have a horse and, you know, have your horsey weekends away. So I don't think it's changed very much. No, no, it really hasn't. I mean, you know, coming into the, you know, post-industrial revolution and, uh, you know, with the mechanization of industry and um, horses kind of being pushed out in terms of labor and, and work, at least in the Western world, um, there, there was this sort of general assumption that or thought that horses would sort of become obsolete, but we did reinvent them and that sort of, the, we, we discovered that, oh, but now we can do all these sort of sports and things with them. And they became a more of a companion animal as opposed to a working animal. And they started to become more accessible to sort of middle class groups. Uh, but even then, there are, I, I know a lot of people who own their own horses. Um, and they, they sacrifice a lot to be able to pay for that animal because they are by no means wealthy. And so it's, you know, I pay for my horse, but I you know, we can't go on vacation. I can't go out for dinner. Um, probably not going to buy new shoes for me because I have to buy new shoes for my horse. So for a lot of people who want to have their own horses, they are in a sense more accessible, but there's a lot that you have to give up to um, maintain that animal in a sort of uh, a suitable and humane way. Wow. I feel slightly, I feel slightly less jealous now of all the horsey people with their daddy bought me a pony. I mean, there are the, the, the wealthy where, I mean, yeah, it just is what it is. You have horses and, and, and you don't need to worry about what it costs to, to keep them. But we are starting to sh see a, a shift where, again, it's not the entire population. They're certainly still out of the reach of a lot of people. Um, but with therapy, there's a lot of therapy programs and, and outreach programs and stuff that use horses to, to uh, sort of reach to reach out to people. They are becoming more accessible probably than they ever have been, um, at least in, in recent memory. So what were horses used for in the ancient world? I mean, you're going to say something really simplistic that, well, hopefully not say something so simplistic, but was there a human horse relationship that goes along with that? Yeah. So... I mean, when we look at 
why horses were domesticated. Um, they, they were domesticated, from, from what we can tell from archaeological evidence, they were domesticated as a food source. I mean, that, that was their initial purpose. Um, it tends to shock a lot of people to realize that because we don't think of horses particularly as being a food source anymore. I mean, yes, people do eat horse meat, um, but it's not really a, a commonplace thing. Uh, but they were initially domesticated as livestock and used for their meat and their milk. Um, horse milk is, uh, has long been a, a staple of the diets of, of nomadic groups in Central Asia uh, and across the steppe. It's, it's one of their primary sources of vitamin C, actually. Um, so they were initially then domesticated uh, for food as a food resource. Um, and from there, obviously, humans made the realization that you could ride these animals, uh, which was quite revolutionary. I mean, you know, yes, you could sort of, you know, ride your donkey and, and, you know, drive an ox cart, but they did sort of alter the way people were able to travel around the world or around their sort of territories. Um, and from there, they then uh, certainly migrate into what has long been their major role, um, which is warfare. I mean, for thousands of years, horses were a, a staple, a mainstay on the battlefield. And again, they very much changed how warfare was fought. Um, they also would have, would have been used for getting around for transportation, um, and, uh, for communication. I mean, the, the Achaemenid Empire, the Achaemenid Empire, the Persians, they basically invent the Pony Express. I mean, the Pony Express was not a, a novel American idea. Um, it comes out of ancient Persia. Um, I mean, the Mongols had a version as well. And then obviously we get the, the American version of the Pony Express, um, they would have been used in processions and parades, again, as a way of showing off wealth and status. Uh, there's nothing quite so impressive as a whole troop of, of prancing, snorting horses clattering down, you know, a, a, a sort of cobbled street or, or, or down a laneway. Um, they wouldn't have been used much in agriculture. Uh, and this is because the, the Greeks, the Romans, they hadn't figured out how to make a proper horse collar. Um, so the, the harnessing systems they had for pulling plows and things worked for donkeys, worked for oxen, but they sort of choked horses a little bit. So the, the horse collar itself is a, a much um, later development. Uh, and then sports. I mean, that was yeah, the big thing. I, I would say in the Mediterranean world, in the classical world, the, the, the big ticket roles for horses were sports and warfare. Um, but was there a horse-human relationship? Of course, yes, there definitely was. Um, were they uh, pets? I mean, that's, that's hard to determine. We know that pet keeping for other animals did exist in, in the ancient world. Um, but these were animals that had a role. But I think anyone who's ever worked with horses in, in any sort of semi-serious fashion will tell you that it's almost impossible to work effectively with the animal unless you have a relationship with them. Yeah. And you know, we get stories like, you know, the, the iconic story of Alexander the Great and his horse Bucephalus and the taming of Bucephalus and um, how no one else could ride this horse. And, and he figured out what was wrong and what the horse was afraid of and so tamed the untamable stallion. And, and when he was on campaign, I think it's when he was in what's, um, what is now Afghanistan, um, some hill tribes uh, stole Bucephalus, I mean, horse thieving. And he basically lost his marbles. He was like, give me my horse back or I will kill everybody because he's Alexander and he really liked his horse. So they gave him his horse back really quickly. Um, we get some references, um, some epitaphs or epigrams for horses, um, you know, commemorating their quirks and, and uh, you know, the fact that they fought on the battlefield and died on the battlefield. Um, so definitely there, there would have been a relationship there. I mean, with, with, studying animals and, and humans and sort of the ancient world it's always tricky to f sometimes find that emotional connection but given how the animal works or and how they behave and the the way you train them um i think it's fairly safe to say that there was there was a human horse relationship you mentioned sport how did the use of horses for sport change in the ancient world is it because we're talking about the whole ancient world it must have changed but are you going to start with the Asiatic steppe? Because that's where they're first domesticated. Yeah, I mean, so, so we have references to um, a variety of different uh, sort of equestrian activities, uh, equestrian sports, uh, forms of entertainment. The steppe is always tricky to uh, trace in any accurate manner because 
uh, they were by and large oral cultures. And so we don't have these written records um, except from outside perspectives, you know, the Greeks and the Romans and, and Persians and stuff looking in on them. Um, so to, to pinpoint where exactly sport, different sports emerge uh, in the Asiatic steppe, uh, it's, it's um, a bit of a shot in the dark sometimes, but there are a lot of, you know, what we could call traditional folk uh, equestrian sports that come out of Central Asia that, again, you, you could probably make suppositions that they've been around for a long time. I mean, we certainly have references to them that are several hundred years old from when Europeans sort of started um, traveling through that that area kind of, you know, in the 1700s, AD and stuff like that. And there's just so much about these sports that, that are so rooted in, in tribal identity that suggests that versions of them are probably far older. Uh, so probably the most iconic sport horse sport that comes out of Central Asia or the Asiatic Steppe uh, is a sport that goes by many different names. It's most commonly called Buzkashi. Uh, it's also known as Ulan Tartush and Kakboru. Um, and it basically means steal the goat. Uh, the buz is a goat car carcass or a calf carcass or a sheep carcass. And it's, um, I suppose the easiest way of trying to describe it is it's kind of like polo, but far more aggressive and played with a dead animal as as the ball sounds like a brilliant game and you have to <laughs> steal the dead goat yeah so um and there's no mallets or anything i mean it's basically um in its initial initial sort of uh incarnation from what we can tell from early explorers talking about it it wasn't a team sport it was um so the chop and dozen are the players uh and it was sort of every man for himself and um, so the carcass, whether it was a goat or a calf or a sheep, would be dropped in the middle of a, a space. Um, and uh, all of the riders would then charge at it and have to basically hang off the side of their horses to, to yank up this, I mean, hefty thing, this carcass, onto their horse. I mean, it probably would have weighed, I don't know, 50, I think it's 50 or 60 pounds at least, if not more. Um, and then they had to break clear and away from the rest of the mob and drop this carcass in an uncontested fashion, which obviously is really ambiguous. So there's lots of disputes over what's uncontested and what is contested because you had to like get away from everyone and somehow drop this carcass with no one near you. And everyone else is trying to yank the, the carcass off your horse. Um, and, you know, the, there's these, these fantastic vivid descriptions of, you know, this mob just galloping across the countryside and they're jumping over hedges and going across ponds and through irrigation canals, it's like clinging to this goat, trying to get away from, from all these other players who are attacking you with their whips and trying to yank it off out of, you know, off from, from where you're holding it on your horse. Um, the, the more modern version is a team sport. Uh, so you've got these two teams and there are there are goalposts that you then have to try and get the, your carcass uh, into. Uh, again, while well, everyone else is chasing after you, trying to, to, to yank it away. And it's utterly spectacular to, to watch in person. Um, it's, the, it's basically the national sport of Afghanistan. It was banned by the Taliban. Um, and so as soon as the Taliban fell, everyone started playing Buzkashi again, like the next day. Because it's Boom. A, entrenched part of their of their heritage and when you play see it in sort of the more rural settings where it's not set in a stadium um it's quite dangerous for the spectators because if you're not paying attention you'll just get run over because they just charge wherever the person with the goat is is going um <laughs> and so there are different stories as to where the sport came from some trace it back to the mongols uh some say it goes past back even further where sort of like you'd be charging through uh, you know, raiding an encampment, like a nomad camp, and you would just like grab people and pick them up and yank them on your horse and, and run away with them sort of thing. Um, some say it was a way of killing wolves. That would, um, that's what the Ulan Tartush basically means to, to go after the wolves who would threaten your flocks. So there's, there's all of these apocryphal tales of where it came from. Um, so we can't say for sure how old it is, but it, it's been around for uh, quite a long time. Um, and then they do things like they wrestle on horseback, which is always quite uh, quite entertaining to watch. And again, you can see how with both Buzkashi and things like wrestling on horseback, there are obvious ties probably to military training. I think with most sports, horse sports, there are these these sometimes very obvious, sometimes more tenuous connections back to needing to train horses for warfare uh, and riders for warfare um, as well. And then if we move into the Mediterranean world, of course, we have some 
more established records of different sports. Um, oh, it's just none of them are going to beat Chase the Dead Goat for me, though. I, probably I don't not. like this goat thing. I was going to say, could we, if we're going to try this at home, can we do it with like maybe a bag of books covered in oil or something? You know, because I can't well, be dealing with this. No, it's got at least be a steak for you symbolism. Can you can play with a synthetic goat as well. And in some of the big matches, because so now there's the World Nomad Games that are held every couple of years. I so want to go to those. Yeah, they were supposed to be held this, this summer of 2020 in Turkey. It was the first time I think they were being held outside of Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. But of course, they cancelled because of COVID. And Damn so they it. played the game there. And I think because they're trying to popularize it and kind of, because like, there are American teams and there are European teams and stuff that come to compete in this game, um, there are sometimes uh, synthetic um, goats that are used. We well, have a stuffed goat, Alina, if it makes you happy. We can make a historian <laughs> team. There we go. <laughs> We have Matilda the stuffed sheep. Uh, she's she's made out of an old carpet. So we use Matilda when we make our half-hearted, vague attempts at trying to play Buzkashi as well. So, yeah, it's harder than it looks. Our horses are also way too big for it. But, uh, yeah. I think we're going to go, let's go more civilised. I'm guessing things get less fun when you move into Greece and Rome. Well, I mean, it's it's far less charging around like a, a mad hatter with a a dead animal on your horse um (laughs) but that doesn't necessarily make it less inherently dangerous or risky um so we we do obviously know more from from the classical world because we have literary records and tons of uh, artistic evidence visual evidence um so i mean equestrian sports have long been part of the olympic games including the ancient olympics they weren't part of the, the sort of first few uh, rounds of Olympics, but they're they're added on relatively early into the creation of the Olympic program. So in the Greek world, you had uh, two types of horse racing. You had the ridden horse races, the Kelles races, and then you had the chariot races. And they were like the big ticket items because again, who's competing in these equestrian sports? It's the elites. Um, and and you get references, these sort of really snooty references in some of the sources with these sort of you know tyrants and kings and aristocrats and members of the you know the one percent, the upper echelon, basically saying, well, I'm not going to compete in the wrestling or the running unless I can compete against people who are just like me. Because if you're the the, the tyrant of Syracuse or something, you don't want to 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 lose to a farmer because that's yeah, you'd not look, look good for the PR. So you stick with the horses, you stick with the ponies. Um, and, uh, so yeah, you know, the chariot race in particular becomes a huge status thing, um, because you need more than one horse. You know, there's the two horse chariot and the four horse chariot races, the four horse chariot race, the Tetrathon was, was the ultimate kind of status event. Um, and, and entering teams becomes a way of, of reinforcing that. Uh, like the, my, one of my favorite historical figures, Alcibiades, the notorious Athenian bad boy, like in, in the middle of the Peloponnesian war, uh, he goes and enters seven chariots in the Olympic games. Like just, an obs- he's, he's forking out an obscene amount of money to do this. And he says, oh, it's to, you know, glorify the state and blah, blah, blah. Um, but really he's like, look what I can do. And, you know, he gives a speech in, in Thucydides talking about how, you know, he finished first and second and fourth or something like that, which in and of itself is really quite fascinating because when it comes to the ancient Olympic Games, no one cares if you finish second. Like, there was no silver medal. You won or you lost. And if you lost, it was shameful. But Alcibiades is really trying to show, like, look how much I have and look how wealthy I am um, and look what I can do in the midst of a war. Oh, no, I'm theoretically doing it for the state, but really it's, it's for him. Um, and we know that these were inherently dangerous, um, certainly at the big games in the, in the big contests, like, like the Olympics and, and the other crown games, the individuals who were either riding the horses or driving the horses would very rarely have been the actual owners. Um, the degree to which they were the charioteers and jockeys were slaves or free is a, a topic up for sort of debate, um, but it wasn't the owners because there was, especially with the chariot races, a really high risk of death um and in horrific accidents um in the on the racetracks and then when we switch to the roman world um the flat racing kind of fizzles out a little bit and they are quite literally obsessed with chariot racing when you think of fans and fanaticism and team riots and 
you know, even like the whole idea of like football hooliganism, you can trace all of that back to the Roman world and their obsession with chariot racing, um, where it just becomes this, this industry. And the, the, you know, the famous Latin saying, Panama circenses, you know, bread and circuses, it existed for a reason. Because this is how you kept the mob happy if you were emperor. You, you gave them food and you gave them horse races. Like you gave them their chariot races and they would be happy and content and they would not try and, and overthrow you. Um, and so, yeah, it becomes, you have four teams, their colors, uh, the blues, the greens, the reds, and the whites. And people were fanatically devoted to their team, to their faction. Um, and it's sort of the point where like, yeah, you don't want to find yourself sitting in the wrong part of the, the circus. Uh, like if you're a green supporter, you probably don't want to find yourself, you know, screaming for the greens in the midst of the blue section. Um, because you know, that might end poorly for you. Uh, some of the emperors like, um, Nero and, and Caligula and Domitian were, were vocal circus fanatics, uh, and they had their own teams, um, that they supported as well. Um, and so it, it becomes, and, and the charioteers themselves at this point, whether they start off as slaves and then become free, we have celebrity charioteers. I mean, basically some, some of the first sort of celebrity athletes who become incredibly wealthy and set up these monuments to themselves. But again, really high risk of death. Um, the charioteers, so the, in the Roman world, the races were about 12 or 12 laps long. So they were several miles long. And it's hot, it's dusty, you're trying to control two or four horses. And so they would actually tie the reins around their waist because their hands would get so sweaty, they'd be trying to keep a hold of them. So they also had a knife that in the event of a wreck, they could try and cut themselves free from the horses before they, they were basically dragged to death. Ah. Uh, so, so that Ben-Hur thing where he's like bumping along behind, it's a little yeah. overdone. Well, I mean... It's Hollywood, you know. <laughs> it was it's brutal, like, I mean, it? The chariots themselves were incredibly flimsy because you wanted them to be as light as possible. Yeah. Um, so there's really nothing to, like you're, you're balancing almost entirely based on your core strength and, and your ability. Um, and we have, you know, going back to the, the actual horse racing, the ridden races, um, a lot of the jockeys were, were probably children or young adolescents because again, you wanted them to be small and light uh, because the horses were quite small. Um, and there's this really famous sculpture, a bronze piece, called the Horse and Jockey of Artemisian, which is in the National Museum in Athens. And I mean, I love it. It's one of my favorite pieces from the ancient world. But the jockey, uh, he's this young boy, um, and he just looks utterly terrified. Like, he's up there. I mean, it, his eyes are missing, so it adds to the effect. But even just the, the expression on his face, he's like, I got nothing. Like, Get I can't. Get me out of here. <laughs> I am just... I am here to make sure the horse keeps going in the right direction. And that's about it. So wow. we have accounts of, of horses who dumped their jockeys in these races um, and were still awarded the victory crown for crossing the finish line first. So the horse was obviously in that context a bit more important than, than the jockey. But oh, I love it. Well, let's, I could talk about this all day without moving on to warfare, but I have a question I really want to ask you because my dad's family are all descended from Alexander the Great's army up in Afghanistan. And oh, cool! So they had horses there, didn't they? Did they play a large role in Alexander's army when he went rampaging across the planet? Yeah, yes. I mean, um, I I am sure I have colleagues in in the Alexander world who who will take me to task for this. Um, some of my dear friends, um, but I will I will one hundred percent stick my neck out there and be like, horse. The cavalry was was an essential component, if not one of the the most foundational components of Alexander's um, success. He, uh, he, he does really quite revolutionize mounted warfare um, with, with what he begins to do with his cavalry, which is, is quite different from how horses had been used in, uh, in combat in Greece prior to this. Uh, he kind of takes them from being these, you know, this, this sort of mobile fighting arm that, that tends to do sort of hit and run tactics and fight from a distance. And, and essentially turned them almost into shock troops where, you know, when Arian describes the Battle of the Granicus, he, he basically describes it as hoplite warfare, as infantry warfare on, hos on horseback, where they're pushing and shoving. And, and Alexander really starts using the horse itself as, um, I don't so much want to say a weapon, but as a partner in, in battle and uses 
This is what I wrote my master's on. So uh, <laughs> so brilliant. But uses basic horse behavior and physiology and body mechanics to actually um, kind of almost fight two battles against the Persian cavalry. There's there's what the dude, the, the horse, the, the riders are doing when, when fighting with their, their weapons and handing you know, swords and, and javelins and spears. But then the horses are also kind of waging almost a, a, a psychological battle because horses are very hierarchical. So of one side sort of trying to dominate the other. And so the horses are posturing and fighting and, and everything as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, horses, the, the, the cavalry was, was absolutely fundamental to um, Alexander's conquest because he's, you know, fighting against horse cultures. I mean, when he, you know, Persia was, was known for its horsemen. Um, there's a very famous type of horse that comes out of, of, of media, out of sort of what's probably ancient Iran and not that part of the world. And then certainly all of the, the, the satrapies, uh, you know, you have these, these nomadic groups, you have these uh, entrenched horse cultures and traditions that are there. And so how do you defeat a horse culture, well, you, you need to have horses to do it and you need to be able to use them effectively in order to do it. Because without it, I mean, if you win, you'll never catch them because they, I mean, Xenophon says this in his analysis, right? Without horses, uh, when he's in Persia, like if we win, our enemies will get away because we can't pursue them on foot. And if we lose, we can't get away because they're on horseback. And so, yeah, the horses were, were incredibly important um, to Alexander's conquest. Well, what about the other armies? Were they just as important for them? Yeah, I mean, obviously it depends on the way horses are used in combat is very much dependent on topography um, and kind of environmental conditions. So you get different styles of mounted warfare uh, appearing in different parts of, of you know, the ancient world, sort of the classical world and its environs. So if we look at, at, at the Asiatic steppe, where you have these wide open spaces, um, nomads who quite literally spend their entire lives on horseback. Like when I was in Mongolia doing, doing some research, you know, there was this kid who was maybe two years old, like still literally toddling around on his own two feet. And they just tie him to the horse. Like they plonk him in the saddle, they tie him to the horse. So like, off you go, ride. And they do. Um, so their style of, of, of warfare, it's, it's very much the mounted archer. Um, they're not fighting in, in close formations. They're honestly just galloping in circles around you, firing an obscene number of arrows in your general direction and, and wreaking havoc on you because of that. And then when you try and pursue them, they just turn around and gallop away and they can usually get away because they're not heavily armed because they're fighting with arrows, bows and arrows from a distance. And, you know, they don't have these cities and settled places that they need to defend like we have endless grasslands if you if you t- we can just go find more grass if you take this grass like we know this place like the back of our hands and you don't um and so they're notorious for for sort of um coming to grips with because they just disappear in into the grasslands um and you can't catch them um if we look at the the sort of the ancient near east uh, which is where we get some of the earliest depictions of mounted warfare coming out of um, ancient Assyria with the transition from chariot warfare to, to mounted warfare. Uh, again, you know, they start off by and large fighting. You see them with, with bows and, and uh, javelins, but there's this really interesting type of horse that comes out of the ancient Near East called the Nisaean horse. And it's much um, bulkier, much heftier, not tall, but just like really stocky. Uh, when compared to other types of ancient horses. And so this is where we start to see the first, what we might call heavily armored cavalry, the cataphracts and the quibinari. Um, And so they tend to fight, you know, some people call it, and I don't know how much I agree with this, but make references to sort of like really rudimentary forms of what you start to see in the medieval world with the fully armored knight and the couched lance sort of attacking their opponents. That's not exactly what's happening um, with this type of horse and this style of combat, but certainly the riders are quite heavily armored. The horses are quite heavily armored. They seem to fight with lances or lance type uh, weapons and kind of charge towards each other. But again, that's only possible because of the type of horse they have, which is created as a result of um, unusual environmental conditions and food availability. And then in the Mediterranean world, like it, the Greek world and the Roman world, Greece in particular isn't really um, ideal for horse breeding. I mean, it's four-fifths mountains, right? If you look at mainland Greece, it's almost all mountains. And even the islands tend to be quite rocky and mountainous. So you don't have 
necessarily a lot of space to 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 raise a lot of horses um which ups their value i mean they they become um quite a bit more of a value or a really highly valued resource and so really up until alexander this reflects the way that they're used in battle there's and i'm not saying that alexander was really nearly throwing his horses away on the battlefield there's always this need to want to keep your horses alive because it takes a long time to train a war horse uh, but there's almost a sense of caution uh, with pre-mass pre-alexander cavalry combat in greece where again there's a bit of a reluctance to to really get into the thick of things um, and risk injuring or or losing your horse, uh, and so they they tend to to use javelins and like I said those those hit and run tactics. So we get a, a variety of different styles of um, mounted combat that appear across the ancient world. Um, and despite what many people have said over time, they were not limited at all by the fact that they were riding bareback. Uh, they didn't have saddles and stirrups. Um, stirrups don't all of a sudden make everyone into magical warriors. Um, these these individuals were incredibly competent and capable of doing pretty much anything you can do with saddles and a stirrup, uh, saddles and stirrups on horses without them, because that's all they knew how to do. That's how they'd ridden their whole lives. So, well, that goes out the window then. Okay. <laughs> that was your answer. I'll just buy some stirrups and then I'll be epic. Exactly. Well, that's a shame. <laughs> Never mind. I mean, stirrups change how you do it um, because it changes your balance. So if you look at mounted archery, the way you shoot your bow off your galloping horse is going to be a bit different. The techniques are going to be different when you're riding bareback and you have to actually be sitting on the horse versus having saddles and stirrups where you can stand up off the horse's back and, and just use your body in a slightly different way. It's not that one is better than the other. It's just what you know in different ways of doing it. So sticking with the subject of armies and horses, Let's touch on um, war horses. Is it possible to train a war horse? Yes. And this is, um, this is actually the question that flung me wholeheartedly into this crazy rabbit hole. <laughs> I, I grew up riding horses and my, I, never had, I didn't have my own horse. My parents were smart enough not to do that. Uh, so as I became more experienced, I kind of rode whatever needed exercise and, and the whole hodgepodge of everything from really well behaved to um, utterly mental. And I started thinking about it being like, who, who the hell thought this was a good idea? Because horses are prey animals. I mean, that's, they, they are large prey animals with a hardwired flight instinct. That's how their species survived for so long is, is, when they think that there might be danger out there, they don't like stop and have a committee meeting and go like, hey guys, you think, you think those wolves over there want to eat us? I don't know. Should we? They just run. And as soon as one starts running, they all start running. They don't logically contemplate the situation. And so to get a horse to go to war, you have to like override this this instinctual behavior that they have. Because when you ride a horse to war, you're kind of like, Hey, Bucephalus, yeah, I know there's a lot of guys over there with really sharp pointy sticks pointed at us, and it looks pretty ominous, and maybe you're thinking we should go the other way, but we're going to go run into them. It's fine. Trust me. We got this. We're just going to go run into the terrifying, deadly-looking stuff in, in front of us. Yeah, if I'm a horse, I'm not having this. No, and, and it, it, when you think of, you know, general horse behavior, the whole idea is utterly absurd, and yet we managed to do it for thousands of years. So there had to be something in there that made it possible. And that's where you come down to, yes, horses are prey animals, but they're also herd animals. And they have um, sort of quite rigid hierarchies within their herds where some horses do tend to be more dominant, uh, more aggressive, uh, braver than other members of the herd. That's how they attain their positions within the hierarchy. So when it comes to, to training a horse to go to war, it's it's all about understanding that animal. And there's a reason why outside of sort of the horse archers of Central Asia, when you look at sort of traditional cavalry combat, it's fought in formations, not just because that allows you to amass more troops, but because that's how the herd works. So it's all about strategically placing different horses in different parts of the formation. If you put your your bold, brave horses at the front, the more timid ones are still just going to follow them because as soon as the herd starts going, they're like, I'm going too, because everyone else is going. If I don't go, I'll die. So 
Um, so it becomes an understanding of horse behavior um, and, and their, their own idiosyncrasies to actually train them to do it. Wow. I've I never also thought use a lot about of, any of this. I also use a lot of food bribery to train my horses to do stuff like this. Oh, I do this <laughs> with my cat. Run someone over, you get a cookie. Um, so, you know. Yeah, my, mine's more eat this biscuit and stop meowing at me when I'm trying to do stuff. But yeah. <laughs> I think this would be a good business for us. We could train war horses. Well, I mean, that's what I always tell people when the apocalypse inevitably happens and all the technology falls apart. My friends and I have, a, who's a jousting group that I work with and, and we do all sorts of wacky things on horseback. You know, we've got fully trained war horses, so we're good to go. Yeah, I'm fully trained up for hunting and gathering. So we should hook up and then we'll form our own little tribe. I, uh, I had, I, this was earlier in the year, I had taken my car in for service. And uh, I always have a random assortment of, of ancient weaponry rattling around because you never know when you might yeah. need to defend yourself in a grocery store. Well, and, so and also, it's not illegal to own a crossbow in the UK. Uh, I don't know if it is here or not. Yeah. But uh, um, so I had like a, uh, a javelin and a hoplite spear um, on the passenger side of my car. And of course, it takes up the whole, so it's quite long. And so I, I went to pick my car up after they were, they were done with the service. And, and the mechanic is looking at me with this very quizzical expression on his face because he's like, what, wh- why, why, why do you have spears in your car? Who doesn't? <laughs> not. Why wouldn't you have spears in your car? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I, I could join it. this uh, group because I'm really good at building stuff. I was uh, a Girl Scout for a really long time and we had to build our own furniture. Excellent. So. There we go. Do you, do you want to know brilliantly? Um, so we also have Kevin. So Kevin, picture the campus guy you've ever met, a large camp man who I love with all my heart, who basically says that if the zombie apocalypse comes, he and there's no PlayStation and no Dr- RuPaul's Drag Race, he doesn't want to live anymore so we can use his ass as bait because he doesn't do running. <laughs> so we even have zombie bait. He's the, he's the sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, he said, just finish me off, make use of me because fuck that. There's nothing worth living for. Anymore. <laughs> That's what he says. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, we've digressed as usual on history hack. <laughs> but it's uh, it, it it doesn't often. So you know, so I've, I've, I've trained some more horses, and then I've I've you know traveled to some sort of far flown places of, of the world to 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 ride horses and hang out with nomads and figure out how it all works, which just never works out well for for the horses I work with back here in in Alberta. Um, cause they're kind of like super soft pansies compared to yeah. what you would find. And you in- come home and you're like, right guys, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> I, had, I love it. I had this horse that, um, wouldn't, he, he's always been really funny about going on horse trailers, horse boxes. And we had just ridden. So we have a hunting club. We don't actually hunt anything. There are no foxes or hounds hunted, harmed in this experience. It's just, we go out on Sundays in the fall and gallop around the countryside and jump things and then have a potluck, but we call it a hunt. Um, and he would refuse to go in the trailer to drive back to our farm, which was my friend's farm, which was, I, I don't know, 10 or 15 kilometers away. And I just got back from Mongolia. So I just rode him. Like, I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> I can do it in my, I'm probably going to get all of these irate e messages now from like animal rights people. But I just like, she eventually, loves horses. He just, eventually, he just uh, got so tired. My friend would pull over with the trailer and we'd kind of estimate how Percy was feeling. And if he was still being a bit of a, 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 a snot, I would just keep trotting him down the road as he's whinnying for his friends. And so finally they pulled over, opened the trailer door, pulled the other horses off. He just like went straight on with me still on his back. He's like, oh my God, just take me home. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, so yeah, my, my research doesn't always work out well for my, the horses I'm used to here. But, uh, but yeah, training war horses is actually a lot of fun. So so let's talk about how you find out about all this stuff because you are so full of knowledge about ancient horses um is it down to digging them up or is it down to written sources we're source nerds on history hack we want to know where you find this stuff it's everything so one of the things that i i think i probably love the most about this research aside from the fact that i just now get to study horses as what i do it's like you know when i go go ride a horse I, I'm still technically working so I don't have to feel guilty about it yeah uh, it's it's everything so the horse itself is a living source I mean yes in in modern times you know we've created all of these different breeds and 
you know, some of them have specialized jobs now, like thoroughbred racehorses or, or warm blood jumpers or, or, you know, Clydesdales to, to, to work in fields and pull heavy carts and stuff like that. But whether you're looking at a, a tiny little Shetland pony or a Shire, the, the basic physiology and behavior and mechanics of the animal haven't changed. I mean, they're still just horses. They just come in different sizes and shapes and colors. And so I would say my most important source is the horses themselves. I mean, they're, they're basically a living artifact uh, where you can then look at your other sources, your textual sources like Xenophon and Arian. And I mean, everyone talks about horses um, and, and the artistics, the visual representation of the art. Again, horses are bloody everywhere in ancient art. Like I was, I was cataloging types of horses in ancient art. So I'd go into like a museum, like the British Museum or something, and be like, okay, I got a, I got a photograph, like all of the Near Eastern Roman and Greek horses in here. There's tons of them. They're endless. They're on everything because they're a status symbol. So that, that led to some meltdowns. Um, and then the, obviously the physical main, remains as well. So whether you're looking at the skeletal remains of the horses uh, or the equipment that was, was used with them um, that we have from um, archaeological context, you kind of combine it all together. And then it's a bit of trial and error. You sort of, you know, people were very disparaging. Uh, scholars have been very disparaging of early riders uh, that you see in, in Near Eastern art with some of the earliest sort of recorded depictions of, of horseback riding where they're riding in a donkey seat. Like they sit really far back on the horse Mm. and so you know people might say they don't know what they're doing or they're obviously very uncomfortable or not particularly secure up there and it's not the best way to ride a horse but there are various reasons why they might do it Um, and so you get on and you try like why would they sit like this you know what does it feel like how does it work Um, and then digging through the sources and looking at modern modern horse breeds or modern horse types in places like Turkey and Greece and and Spain and and sort of across that part of the world, you realize that there are breeds of horses that are gated. Um, So all horses walk, trot, canter, and gallop. But some breeds of horses have an extra gait, um, which is always super comfortable to ride. It's it's like sitting in the back of a Cadillac. Uh, The Icelandic horses do this. And there's this sports contest, I guess, where you sit on them while they're they're doing this special gait and hold, hold your pint of beer. Uh, and you don't, you, you're supposed to not spill the beer as they're motoring along. You just sit there drinking your beer on this, this horse that's, that's going. Um, but when you ride these gated horses, you, you sit differently. You actually sit farther back. And so when you look at this, these artistic representations of people sitting farther back on the horse in this chair seat or this donkey seat, yeah, maybe they didn't know what they were doing. Or maybe it has something to do with the type of horse they're riding and the way it moves. And so you look at the, the text, you look at the, the equipment, you look at the art, and you look at the, the existing horse cultures that are still around in those parts of the world, you kind of piece it all together. Alina, do you want me to break your heart completely? Don't break my heart. These little Icelandic pony things are so cute, but like you're not allowed. They don't leave the country because they have never been infiltrated with like diseases and things from outside. So if an Icelandic pony trots off to go to i don't know norway for a competition or they whatever. can never go back they can never go home yeah so i mean there are plenty of people who breed them outside of iceland but yeah if you take one from iceland um you can't then take it back because no. they're worried about uh disease and and things that these horses don't have immunities to yeah so that's it that horse can never go home that's so sad <laughs> well you give it a new home yeah i know one that isn't as cold <laughs> <laughs> Icelandic they horses are cool. They are. They're super cool. They yeah. look, then they always look like fuzzy teddy bears in the winter, and they're tiny, tiny but super tough and easily carry full grown adults. But they're not. Um, they're not as small as my favorite horse in the whole wide world. Oh, you talking about Shetland ponies? Oh God, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, one of these I'd like, and I'd keep it in my house because it's that small, and I want. Oh, the the Falabellas or the minis? I want a Falabella so bad because they're so cute and tiny. It's, they're about the size of Nero. I know, but yeah, Nero they're, would they're try and eat some... it. Yeah, Nero might eat it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. Full grown, like full size horses, um, often tend to just utterly their brains fall out when they see minis for the first time. They're like, "What? What on earth is that? It's like me." but it's tiny and it, and it barely comes up to my knees and what's going on. And then you can just see them. They have these sort of like little, not all of them, but some of them have just these meltdowns trying to figure out what this tiny pocket version um, of them is. 
So outstanding. I have to ask. So I know that like America used to be full of roaming wild horses, didn't it? Are there loads of breeds that are gone now? And also, it was breeding the same back then. I mean, obviously, you can't jerk a horse off and send a, a sample on Concord in the ancient world, but like <laughs> roughly speaking, because they do that with racehorses, don't they? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. They, 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 well, I think with racehorses, because the thoroughbred world is actually really quite funny. They're very, very traditional. Yeah. So I don't think they actually allow is it by hand. It has, it's still yeah. Other breeds, it's yeah, tons of artificial uh, insemination. But I think with thoroughbreds, I've always wondered about the mental health of the people who like you know. Say say you go on a Tinder date with someone, and you're like, so what do you do? Oh, I wank off horses for a living. Just <laughs> like. <a> job. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> is their job satisfaction because if there is frankly that's weird and illegal that's here a bit concerning yeah um, so yeah in terms of breeding uh i mean i don't i don't like using the term breed uh to designate ancient horses i use type because a breed is quite an anachronistic term and it's mm. it's it's often you know you have you can have all of these different horses that come from the same general region like you know we could look at the the european warm bullets that that sort of rule the olympic disciplines now um and they all come from different parts of like germany and the netherlands and, and france and belgium and and uh, you know all across there and they all have different breeds and different breed registries and breed regulations but by and large they're in terms of appearance and what they're bred to do, they're really not that different. They're bred to do the same thing, right? Yeah. So it becomes more of a regional, like, hey, this is our horse versus your horse sort of thing. Um, so, I mean, I talk about types, and these types are very much created by environmental factors and, and use. Uh, but yeah, there was, we know that there, there, again, in certainly the Near East and the Mediterranean world, that there, there were breed breeding programs. Um, you know, we hear stud farms, uh, from the ancient Near East, you know, looking back to Assyrian records and and things like that, references to horses sort of being bred in a, a regulated sort of large scale, um, where they they seem to be keeping some sort of records as to who is 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 coming from where, uh, and horses then being shipped from one part of the Assyrian Empire to to the other. Um, again, we have references to horse breeding coming out of the classical world as well, um, and in talking about sort of you know, what type of stallion to use, what type of mare to use, what features you should look for, um, what what type of temperament and, and how old they should be, and, and then when you should start training the young horses. So we know that there is a, uh, an attention to breeding, um, but it's not necessarily the equivalent, equivalent of what we have now in the modern world where you have these breed registries. Um, and, you know, to, to have your horse uh, registered within them um, there are often different tests and evaluations and, and procedures and protocols that that you have to go through um, in the ancient world it seemed to be more interest in keeping track of where horses are coming from I mean yes by the time we get to the Roman world we do know of horses being bred kind of for specific jobs like you've got your war horses and you've got your race horses and then you've kind of got your your everyday getting around horses um, so there are breeding programs. We we have the references to them. Um, they're just not, I think, quite as, um, I don't know, over the top as some modern breeding programs might be, or or as intense as some modern breeding programs might be. So I want to ask because in some parts of the ancient world, you've got various cults like the cat cult in ancient Egypt and hippos and various random animals where says a hip where is there a hippo cult in egypt really? in egypt of course where else i know they used to eat them and shoot them and hunt them and stuff but was there a cult? there was a there's the goddess i can't remember i can't pronounce the name correctly mm. but mm. you know the, the various different you know cults of all sorts but is there such a thing as a, whole, a horse cult oh gosh yes um so the the best known horse cult uh, is the cult of the Pona. Uh, which comes out of um, it seems to originate in Gaul. <laughs> the Legend uh, of Zelda. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of a modern take on it. I think. Yeah, it's the, that's the horse's name, Elena. Um, so Epona <laughs> really just means horse or or someone who is on a horse, and so she's a uh, she's a Celtic goddess, um, and her her worship seems to have possibly originated in northeastern Gaul and then sort of spread out um, from there. So when we look at Epona's uh, iconography, she is always depicted with horses. Um, often she's depicted sitting on a horse, so sitting in side saddle, 
I mean, side saddle without a saddle, sitting, sitting aside on a horse as opposed to a stride. Um, or she'll be seated between a couple of horses uh, holding a cornucopia. So she's obviously a, a goddess of, she's the goddess of horses, but she's also connected to agriculture um, and fertility. And uh, her cult then spreads across the Roman Empire because, of course, cavalry is, is a big part of the Roman army and they draw, they have all these different uh, auxiliary cavalry groups that they're drawing in from the provinces where Epona is already sort of entrenched as a really important deity. And so they kind of bring the, the worship of Epona uh, with them and, and she's often connected to, to cavalry. Um, and then uh, ancient Thrace, so it's kind of modern day Bulgaria, um, was was known for for being a horse culture as well. I mean, horses are really important in Gaul and in Celtic cultures, uh, equally super important in, in Thracian cultures. Um, and so we have all of these sort of monuments and inscriptions that show riders, um, the, the Thracian horse rider, and they seem to be, there's still debate about what exactly is going on, because it seems to be incorporating aspects of, of um, Greek religion within Thracian religion, uh, but they seem to be hero cults. Um, and again, they're always depicted on horseback. And we have loads of um, uh, burials that include horses that come from the Thracian world. Uh, and also across, I mean, the Asiatic steppe. There's, there's, horses are a common grave good uh, in many parts of, of, many regions of that part of the world. And so, yeah, we do. We have, we have, there are definitely horse cults um, because this is uh, such a, a, an important animal. So. I know you've got an issue with Hollywood. Tell us, what is it? So, um, I've spent, certainly as a graduate student, this was like one of my manifestos, every conference I went to, sort of like hammering this home, uh, how big ancient horses were, and they weren't big. So you watch any sort of like sand and sword Hollywood movie, and I can guarantee you there's going to be a Frisian. So those are the black horses with the, the mm-hmm. big furry legs. They would always, there's always a Frisian. I mean, in the horrid Alexander movie, Bucephalus became a Frisian, which is a horse from the Netherlands, not Greece. Uh, and then there's the Iberian horses, the, the Spanish and the Portuguese horses. The, they're, they're always the white colored ones because they're, su- they're they're very trainable and they're very fancy looking. Yeah, like this is the one in Lord of the Rings, right? That yeah, yeah. Oh, and that. Game of Thrones, there's a white horse prancing they're around always, as well. That, that's your Spanish horse. There's always the Iberian horses and then the Frisians, always. Um, I just wait for them to appear, at which point I just start yelling at the screen. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, I mean, so... The horses of the ancient world, of, of you know, uh, of the, the Greek world, the Roman world, uh, the Near East, Central Asia, um, they're, they're small. Uh, I mean, in terms of height designations, we'd probably call them ponies, so under 14.2 hands. But they, they were actually small horses as opposed to ponies because there's some physiognomic differences. But they were, they were quite tiny. Uh, so when you, when you look at their, the representations of these horses in art, people often struggle to accept that and like like they, when they talk about the parthenon frieze like oh they've made the horses look small to glorify the human form like no that's how big they were and if you go to greece today and you go to the mountains and you look at the greek mountain ponies that's how big they are because big horses bless them are utterly impractical um they 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 need a lot of food um in terms of their their physical form they're they're harder to maintain they're more prone to injuries because they're so big and again coming back to the fact that they didn't have saddles and stirrups so you had to be able to get on your horse from the ground like you couldn't stop in the middle of a battle be like excuse me stop everybody i need someone to boost me onto my horse (laughs) (laughs) by which point you would have had your head cut off yeah you had to be able to jump on and and you travel to to central asia those horses are all tiny because they that's how they survive out there they're not kept in stables they're not coddled they're not pampered in the way that sort of western horses are and so you know we create big horses relatively late in history even thinking of medieval knights they were not going to war on a Clydesdale they were not going to war on a Shire or a Percheron they were they were riding those Spanish horses by that point in time because size doesn't equate strength it's all about how they're built um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, Alexander the Great basically conquered his empire on a, what we would consider a very small horse. Um, but that was what was suited to the environment and, and certainly far more adaptable and um, kind of practical than, than a lot of the horses that we use uh, for sports and such in, in the modern world. So yeah, you know, they rode tiny horses and people just have a really hard time grass is sort of accepting it because we think of, of ponies as being for little kids, a fully armed warrior on you know a 14 hand horse is just very odd to a lot of people 
What is the film, though, that's hilarious where the person can't ride and they put them on a tiny, tiny horse and it's hilarious? Oh, God. Oh, oh it's completely God. left my mind now, but it's like a... Oh, oh Sherlock Holmes. I think that's it. Sherlock yeah. Holmes yeah, and they put them on a tiny little... A tiny little yeah. So yeah. that basically is what Alexander's battles look like. Yeah, I mean, they were maybe a little bit bigger than that, but uh, but they were by no means tall. I mean, I think 15 hands it would have would have been considered quite tall for, yeah. for a, a horse. And, and a lot of the archaeological evidence certainly seems to to support this. So, Size matters, ladies. Size matters. Sometimes bigger isn't better. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Carolyn, thank you so much for coming on to talk to well, us. Well, thank you about... for having me. It's been, uh, it's been an absolute delight to uh, spend some time talking about horses. Oh, I feel like we, you need to come back and do like a specific rather than an overview. Like I feel right. we need to do cavalry and Alexander warfare. Any, any time. I'd, uh, I'd be more than happy to do that. Alina's the booking fairy. Alina, make it happen. It will be awesome. I will make it happen. Super. Along with the other 300 things I've screenshotted and sent you and said, make them happen. But make this happen. <laughs> make it so. But yeah. <laughs> join us tomorrow when ricky phillips will be with us to bust every myth we can get to inside an hour about the falklands war and there are a lot of them uh, as he points out there's actually only one day in the entire 70 odd days of conflict where the british and the argentinians actually agree about what happened so don't miss that one don't forget that we do exist on patreon as history hack and on patreon as well which is podbean's own version uh elena and i have had massive fun doing this in 2020 uh but life is going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living etc if we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload then we will need your help there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms we're revamping ourselves on both of them so don't forget to go in you can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up history hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year we are now on youtube we are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms so you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time so do go over there and subscribe